Good morning. It is uh, a pleasure and a, a privilege to be here with you this morning and able to address you. I had a friend once who used to say that what I did in the week was my work. What I did on Sunday was my privilege. It seems from today's gospel reading that Jesus is calling his disciples, his followers along the way, to be counterculture, not to live by the, like the scribes and Pharisees and other hypocrites, and also know that they will be persecuted and hated and killed for the sake of the gospel. Abraham too, I suppose, was being called by Yahweh to do the same thing to leave what was known and comfortable, if any part of a semi-nomad life could be called comfortable, and follow an unknown path to an unknown destination. In modern parlance, Yahweh was asking Abraham to take a risk and trust that this God was indeed worth following and obeying. Generally, we think of Abraham as the first real or historical figure in the Hebrew scriptures. And a person who is frequently cited in later scripture as an example of faith. I don't know about you, but I have trouble feeling connected to him. Not least because he lived 4,000 years ago in a different land and in a very different way to where I live and the way I live. And he showed willing to sacrifice his son Isaac to prove his fidelity to God. I don't think I could do that, though I haven't checked with Alistair. By comparison with Jesus, who lived on this earth a mere 2,000 years ago, it is relatively easy to ask that question in times of conflict or uncertainty. WWJD, what would Jesus do? I don't think I've ever heard the question or thought of it myself. WWAD, what would Abraham do? St. Paul in our epistle reading for this second Sunday in Lent provides us with a rather obtuse argument that while the Jews and descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are linked as by family ancestry, DNA, if you like, and therefore direct heirs of the blessing, we Gentiles are not part of that family. Nonetheless, uh, because of the blessing not that was not exclusively for the direct descendants of Abraham, ethnically Semites, though they certainly did think that it was for them alone. St. Paul argues that we are linked, whether by race or class, we are linked by divine adoption and thus heirs of the same promise through faith and not works of the law. Sort of like everybody's Irish on St. Patrick's Day, which makes, makes this old curmudgeon want to be as un-Irish as possible. Though I was thinking of making my own cornbread, if that, corn beef, thank you, if that, <laughs> corn beef, if that counts. I better start today because it takes ages. There's much about, <clears throat> pardon me, there's much about Abraham's life as it is described in Genesis that is fantastical not least getting his mojo on at 100 years of age, fantasy or super stud. And not forgetting his good lady Sarah, or Sarai, better known as the mother of nations and tribal peoples and tribes. And she was no spring chicken either. She probably had all the packing up in order to follow while her husband rounded up the livestock and the rest of the family. This was going to be a long journey, especially when they didn't know where they were going. Like all semi-nomadic peoples, even today in certain parts of the world, 
they were used to moving as they followed the rains and the result of the earth, the fruits of the earth, not least what you might expect in a desert land. You can hear all those children in the back saying, are we there yet? When are we going to be there? I'm bored. She touched me. Uh, okay, that's me living and ad living and then using my place. We watched uh, the movie Nomadland, Nomadland the other evening, specifically about a middle-aged woman who didn't want to be hemmed in, always on the road and living out of her van. What she, when she did have, and greatly valued, was a sense of community amongst fellow travelers that she ran into along the way. She had trust in her own processes and believed she was happy, or at least happier than settling down. She had done that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, when, her her, when the town died on the closure of its only mill, the gypsum plant, its one employer, everyone had to leave. And she took to the road. Abraham was specifically chosen to be the progenitor of a tribe which would morph into a nation, always or mostly under the protection of the one God, Yahweh. Those times when they didn't seem to be thriving and God seemed absent from them, their prophets attributed that to the people's sin in breaking the commandments, which Paul, for example, was quick to point out that if you break one of the commandments, you are guilty of breaking them out all. There are no gradations of sin. Sin was sin and provoked the Lord to wrath and often to action. So they thought anyway. I have trouble with that theology and am more of the opinion shared by the psalmist. Why are the ungodly in such prosperity? Why indeed? Very much and compellingly, their special relationship with God came with many rules and regulations. And as they advanced and became better at sinning, so the nation which issued from Abraham and Sarah's union, however unlikely such a fruitful union of a geriatric husband and wife might be, unless we are biblical literalists, and I'm certainly not one of those. We can take these great age, ages and poetic license and assume that this couple were well past the age of childbearing. Whatever number you want to put on that doesn't really matter. The point of the story of God entering into a covenant with Abraham and Sarah and their descendants is that their new God was able to do marvelous things such as providing them with a legitimate heir and leading them to a new home, which would be a nice place with water and trees and stuff. The Bible never gives a reason why. Why God chose this particular couple to be the foundation of God's salvation plan, which was to save the human race which had become wavered and alienated from God. Indeed, by the time we get to the Moses part of the story, well, the salvation plan story, that is, the Hebrews had all but forgotten their God and their divine commission, that they were to be a blessing to others, as well as being blessed by God themselves. You'll remember, likely, the story of Moses and the burning bush, the incident at the beginning of Exodus chapter 3, where Moses is chosen to be the one who would bring the now slave nation out of bondage in Egypt. He asks the voice of this strange burning bush, what is your name? Indicating that he didn't know. What will I tell them when they ask me, who is this God? What's his name? The enigmatic reply, I am who I am. I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Later in their wanderings, didn't Moses come down from the mountain to find them worshiping an idol? 
made from their gold. Hmm, interesting. Seems to be a popular thing even today, worshiping gold, worshiping an idol. Notwithstanding the passage of more than a thousand years between Moses and his covenant with Yahweh and the apostle Paul and the new covenant, we're still using, or Paul is still using Abraham as a model of faith, which he's not seeing amongst his own contemporary Jews. Himself a Pharisee, no less, top of his graduating class in Pharisee school, he tells us in Galatians. That's about all the exegetical stuff that I can stand. How about you? A segue is on the way. With all this promise and blessing, there must come responsibility. What was Abraham's and his descendants' responsibility? To me, it's, it seems that it consisted first and foremost of faithfulness to their one God and one God only, followed by keeping the rules. Most succinctly stated in the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words. The first commandment there, maybe they are gradated, I could be wrong. The first commandment being worship one God only. That was a must. And Yahweh alone serve. Do not bow down before an idol and the rest. What God's blessing of these people does not seem to include is any missionary outreach at all. Judaism is not a missionary religion. Christianity certainly is, and Islam, to be sure. There will not be any Jewish folks knocking on your door on a Saturday or Sunday morning in the burbs. Therefore, the blessing that Abraham received and passed on down in his family, if it wasn't about spreading the faith beyond that family, and it doesn't seem to have been, what a shock it must have been for those Jewish disciples of Jesus when he commissioned them to go into all the world and spread the gospel, the good news. And what was the good news? Well, astonishingly, which God loves everyone and required that his followers follow suit. You have been blessed. Now go into all the world and preach and act out that message. If they're preaching and acting out that message, what they preached, if it didn't primarily include loving their neighbors, then it wasn't actually good news at all. Segue ahead. Nothing comes closer at the present time, tragically, than the coronavirus for exposing the great gulf that exists between the haves and the have-nots at home and throughout the world. Every night, nearly, it seems, the newscaster or anchor person will preface a news item. Some viewers may find these images disturbing. We should not turn away, though. We should look and see and be disturbed. Articles and television reporting over these past months demonstrate the possibilities of serving the common good without fear or favor. The remarkable speed and efficiency of the development of vaccines Dem demonstrate what can happen when scientists and other brainy people set out to achieve something with the utmost urgency. They become a blessing to millions. However, this unfortunately, however, and this unfortunately is a big however, those who are blessed by receiving the care they need and the vaccine they needed when they need it have a responsibility to pass on their blessing to others less fortunate. I'm speaking corporally now, or corporately, one of those words. Um, the nations and those individuals living in poverty and disease without hope in the world, that is, again, to say, those have been so blessed have a responsibility to spread that blessing. 
a Star Tri Tribune article, I think it was a couple of Sundays ago, on the state of health and the toll on reservation lands and in the American Indian community. It was very sobering with incredible pictures. Though we might certainly have expected as much that in the richest and most blessed nation in the world, 40 million go to bed hungry every night and many millions more of food are housing insecurity. Our shining city on a hill is a bit tarnished. And I certainly don't consider myself um, morally blameless, like King David, I could say. My sins are ever before me. What kind of blessing are we passing on when our own countrymen and women are crying out as if they had tears left to shed? From that article, one person said, we are dying, said one elder, yes, and we are losing our language and our culture as well as our lives. So what little supply of the vaccine they are receiving in native communities, they are giving first to the old folk who hold the sacred treasury of their past and are the only ones who can pass it on. At a powwow a couple of summers ago, Mary Jo pointed out to me that the children were first around the food tables loading up their plates. Well, that didn't seem very strange. Looking out for themselves, taking care of number one. Not at all, not a bit. They were loading up the plates and taking them to the elders before they got food for themselves. Now that would be counterculture in a society we live in where it's number one, me first. Dr. Tedros, with the impossible to pronounce last name, the head of the World Health Organization, remarked at a news conference earlier last week, quote, the world faces a catastrophic moral failure because of unequal COVID vaccine distribution. A catastrophic moral failure. Those are strong words. Dr. Tedro said it was not fair for younger, healthier people in richer nations to get injections before vulnerable people in poorer states and nations. Over 39 million vaccine doses have been given in 49 richer states, but one poor nation, 25 doses. God's promise to Abraham and his descendants was this, among other things, like obedience. Those, those who you bless, I will bless. And those you curse, I will curse. That sounds a bit serving, does it not? Who wrote this anyway? Let me rewrite, rewrite that promise. Because I chose to bless you. You must bless others. Pass it on, pass on along that blessing. My dearly beloved sister Dorothy, not really, uh, died 15 months past, didn't consider Muslims in general and Palestinian Muslims in particular, not only not blessed, but unworthy to live where they live. Never mind their ancient claims to the promised land. Speaking of the Palestinians, how was their share of the Israeli vaccine stock? My friends, brothers and sisters in the faith, we may not every day think of ourselves as being spiritual kin to Abraham and his descendants, but we are. And the blessings poured out on God's chosen people then are promised to us now through the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross, accessed 
by our baptism. In a flight of literal, poetic, and I believe divinely revealed insight, the same Apostle Paul in the same letter wrote these words to Roman Christians, AD, CE, about 50 or 60 something. Beginning of chapter nine and speaking or writing of the privileged place of the people of Israel in God's economy, he is, as he describes it, in great anguish for his own people who have rejected Jesus as Messiah. I don't really understand this argument in the passage. It's Hebrews 9 through 11, but he writes, speaking of his own people. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. There is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. That promise of blessing is no longer confined to the physical descendants of Abraham, but to all people who love their God and their neighbor and to stand up and fight for equity and inclusion in our own country and amongst, amongst our world's most of the neglected and scorned peoples. Paul, again, in that same passage, though it seems contrary, states, the gifts and the promises of God are irrevocable. You and I are the blessed of God. With whom will we share our blessings? Amen.